Sling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern. It is Friday here on this program. And you know what that means. Lots to talk about here today. We got news. Got updates on the death of Scott Hall. Jeff Hardy talking about walking out of WWE, which led to him walking out of WWE and right into AEW. Did a big interview talking about that. We've got updates on Simon Diamond, who is out of the hospital after recently suffering a stroke. He was hospitalized this past Friday after what was described as a mild stroke. The 53-year-old, quote, is currently dealing with impaired vision and will have a long recovery period ahead. He works for the NWA. Their director of talent relations will not be in attendance for the Crockett Cup this weekend. So all of the best to Pat Kenny, would be his real name. And he tweeted out Tuesday, Life is precious. Hug your children. Tell family and friends you love them. Life is a girl. Do not take it for granted. So, best wishes to uh, to Pat Kenny, the former Simon Diamond there. We've got news on Dynamite and uh, Kenny Omega. We've got an injury in New Japan. Sonata broke his orbital bone. So a lot to get into here today. The second segment of the show, we're going to be joined by Dave Meltzer. A lot of big stories in the newest edition of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, so we're going to go over all of those. And, of course, Mike Sempervivi will join us as always. We can take your feedback later on, 425-780-7566. That is the text message line, 425-780-7566. Brian at WrestlingObserver.com is the email. At Brian Alvarez on Twitter. Mike is at SemperVivi on Twitter. There's a lot of different ways to contact us here today. Stick around back in a moment, everybody. Observer Live. I'll try to bring the mood up later, but... All the news is not good. In an interview with Dave Meltzer for this week's Scott Hall obituary slash biography in the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, Sean Waltman revealed that Hall was on the floor for several days with a broken hip until Diamond Dallas Page went to his house. Hall passed away Monday at 63 years old after suffering three heart attacks last Saturday as a result of a blood clot that developed following surgery for the aforementioned hip. Waltman told Meltzer Hall fell at home, was unable to move, nor get to a phone to call for help. Several days later, friends asked Page to check on Hall as they couldn't get in touch with him, which resulted in Page then finding him and getting him to the hospital. Waltman also said that Hall's condition had deteriorated badly due to drinking brought on by two years of pandemic-related isolation. The pandemic did him in, said Waltman. It was hard enough for him as it was, but he was isolated in his house with no social interaction. He was down to 210 pounds. We called uh, Dallas Page, and he went over. It was really bad. Waltman said in February he offered to stay with Hall because of his worsening condition. Meltzer reported Hall had been in rough shape the night before last year's NWO Hall of Fame induction at WrestleMania 37 as he had passed out in the bar the night before. While the story the public thought was that he had horrible drinking issues, but through working with Page he had licked it and turned things around. According to Waltman, there were times that was at least close to being the case, but things got really bad over the last two years, Meltzer wrote. Talking about Hall, Waltman also told the story of how Hall tutored wrestlers he saw a future in on how to go above and beyond in interacting with fans. One of these fans was current AEW roster member Powerhouse Hobbs. Subscribers can read the entire bio. More quotes from Waltman on the influence Hall had in the industry. New Observer up on the front page right now. We're going to have Dave on in about uh, 10 minutes talking more about what's in the Observer. But, uh, yeah, rough story. You know, when when you have an old relative, like uh, Granny, for example, she's 92, and uh, she has one of those gimmicks that you wear around your neck in case you, you fall uh, they're pretty advanced now. I, I think it can actually, like, sense, like, a rapid, you know, I could be wrong about all this, but there's also a button on it. But anyway, so if she falls, she has the, uh, the life alert deal. Problem is, when you're, like, 62, 63 years old, you're not thinking about getting a life alert deal. And, uh, you know, you fall and break your hip, and days he was there before he was found. So... Sad story. We've uh, talked about Hall for many days, but uh, obviously if you want to send in more, you're, you're welcome to 425-780-7566. We also had Jeff Hardy talking about 
why he did what he did during that infamous December WWE live event and why he signed with it. Well, I know why he signed with AEW. But he said, certainly things happen for a reason. Subconsciously, that was one of the smartest, maybe the smartest thing that I have ever done. Guided by someone higher than me, I'll say. This was a tag match, Edinburgh, Texas, December 4th. Hardy tagged out of a trios match and then exited through the live crowd as the match was still going on. He was sent home by WWE the following day, later released. He said, that night in Edinburgh, Texas, for some reason I finished my heat, I took the heat, and I just said, I'm ready to go. Went over the railing, disappeared into the crowd, and naturally they think I took something like drugs or whatever, but I didn't. I thought, man, just another unpredictable thing that I can do, and I'll get away with it. But it was more serious than that. But again, it was one of the smartest things I have ever done because everything worked out so perfectly, mainly because my first day in AEW, I felt valuable for the first time, just the care and the love that I was shown. Whereas at WWE, I just felt like they were just wanting to keep me there to sell more action figures. He later clarified he was not trying to get released, but was doing something that felt right in the moment. He said he was going to leave WWE when his contract was up regardless, but still had two years left. He said he did have some glimmers of hope in the last few months. The last glimmer of hope was the Survivor Series, which was really good. Came down to me and Seth Rollins. I almost won. The crowd was so behind me. I felt like one of the most popular babyfaces in WWE because the crowd was so with me. It was a feeling that he had had before. The frustration after last year's SummerSlam when he was brought to Vegas and didn't do anything on the show. There were times I felt like a ghost roaming the hills. Like, uh, why am I even here? I don't feel important at all. But I kept doing my deal. I would show up and do whatever they wanted me to do. I also spoke about WWE's offer to put him in the Hall of Fame, saying he almost felt offended and very emotional as it did not feel right. I was in tears because I was like, this is my career. I know I've been a very influential person to a lot of young, misunderstood individuals. It just felt so wrong. It almost felt like, how dare you? It's not the time for that. That was why I was kind of like, that's a hard no. You know, when this thing happened, there were uh, people that thought that he was uh, he was trying to get fired. And uh, and I never I never believed that. And the reason for that was the um, I think my child just took a bump. She may be storming in here at any moment. <laughs> um, where was I? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't uh, I didn't think the guy was trying to get fired because uh if you remember, he walked out, and uh, and there was like this immediate assumption that like something was wrong, and that maybe it was was drugs or whatever. And uh, but there was insistence from I'll just say the hardy side that he absolutely had not been taking, or drinking, or doing anything. And in fact, in fact, there was an insistence to like drug test him and tell everybody what the results are. Because obviously fans' immediate assumption was that he had been on something. And so when they were so, they were so insistent, drug test him, show everybody the results. And Matt Hardy even went public with that. You know, it was, it was clear to me that actually he probably wasn't on anything. And what I thought initially was, you know, maybe he's bumped his head. Maybe he had some sort of injury. He was just like, I'm out of here. Turns out it wasn't that either. But the fact of the matter was he wasn't on any substances. And, and really, what they did, quite honestly, is they jumped the gun and they fired him. And it was always weird that they fired him because they fired him and there was that repeated insistence release the drug tests release the drug tests so fans know he wasn't on anything and then of course you know he gets released and he's got his 90 days and then the 90 days it's coming near and all of a sudden they're like you know you ever thought about coming back we'll offer you this hall of fame and then it was like well what'd you fire him for like what did you do that for especially if you actually had a negative drug test now you're all anyway whatever that's the story he, uh, he just was like, I'm done. I'm taking a break. And they, they decided he must have been on something. They fired him. Then they were regretful. And now here he is in AEW. Well, he was right. Didn't you mention in there he said he could get away with it? <laughs> that's well, what he was in the moment. That's what he was thinking. I'm out of here. And he was spiritually guided away through the crowd, posing for pictures on his way out of the building while his partners looked for the tag. But it looked... It, We don't hear about this much anymore because the environment has changed. But how many times in pro wrestling did somebody's career end just like that? 
well, okay, not not just like that, leaving through the crowd, but how many times did somebody just say, I'm done? And instead of going to the next town, they got in their car and they drove home. You know what I'm saying? It, it, that's how it used to go down a lot. I Tony should mention Storm. too. I Tony should mention Storm. very quickly, by the Go way, ahead. that that uh, it wasn't just like you know mad, but I I talked to people that were at that show that worked that show, and you know they were they were worried because obviously that's bizarre behavior to just walk out of a match and leave. But I mean, to a person, they were like, he seemed fine all day. There didn't seem to be anything wrong with the guy. So well, yeah, and Tony Storm, like between Washington D.C. and Baltimore, said no. I'm not doing this, and got on a plane and went home, and we haven't seen her since. And she's still got, a, I would assume, a contract that is being held up right now because she, the way she left WWE. So this is, again, it is new by today's standards, but in the history of pro wrestling, this has happened a lot. The the famous story with Jack Briscoe just getting on the plane and looking to the next plane that goes south, I'm on it. And he did and never came back again. And that was that. So it's, uh, it's happened in the past before. And if anybody today is going to do it, it is going to be somebody in the vein of a Jeff Hardy, who is pretty much a free spirit anyway. Back in a moment with big Dave a wrestling observer live. And Mr. Wrestling Observer himself, Dave Meltzer, joining us here today. The new issue is up on the front page of WrestlingObserver.com right now. If you're a subscriber or if you subscribe today at WrestlingObserver.com, you can read this whole issue. It's about 45,000 words. I could actually probably find out here, but there's a lot to talk about. And uh, gigantic uh, bio of Scott Hall obviously is the lead story. And we talked a little bit about the Waltman interview, talking about him falling at home. But uh, what else did you learn in putting this bio together? That's a tough one. I mean, um, I mean, I knew most of the background already, um, so I can't say I learned a lot about that. I mean, I learned some things from his friends as far as, you know, the last 10, 15 years of his life, you know, when he was more out of wrestling than in it. Um you know, just kind of his ups and downs and things like that. And I mean, I knew, I knew the stories of like him being like clean and everything. You know, that the public thought was was not really the case. But I also didn't know just how bad it had gotten in the last couple of years. Um, you know, and and uh, and that was kind of sad. And obviously, the 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 situation as far as his death is is really horrible in a lot of ways. Um, and also the fact that that his friends saw it, knew, it, knew it was coming, which I also didn't realize. Dave, I don't want to take this too much away from Scott Hall, but the really very sad notation uh, that Sean Waltman told you about him being on the floor for several days and, and having so many issues because he was so cut off from the world because of COVID. Have you heard of, of, of many stories like that from older wrestlers and from wrestlers who have been suffering from addled from drugs and alcohol in the past? I mean, it's kind of a forgotten thing, maybe in wrestling, that, that this has affected people so much because they have been so cut off from family and friends and places that they they usually needed to go for support. You know, I haven't heard stories like that. I mean, the, the stuff that I've heard is more, um, you know, wrestlers who've gotten it um or or you know people who've gotten it and you know there's been a a lot of wrestler and and people in wrestling who have have passed away due to covid um you know not a you know more in mexico than anywhere else but you know i mean a lot in the united states you know like butch reed and jim crockett and and jim crockett jr and so many others where you um you know people kind of uh sometimes dismiss it but when you know i'm writing about it and it's people that you kind of know it's it's hard to dismiss you know one of the other big stories in the issue is about the double or nothing show which is still uh months away may 29th t-mobile arena and there are only 585 tickets left at this point months out it's at a 1.145 million dollar gate it is the Largest non WWE gate in the history of professional wrestling, beating the New Japan Ring in, of in, Honor in, show in North America. There's a lot North of America, Japan, yes, obviously. J Japan shows, but yeah, as far as in North America, it it broke the record. Yeah. So you know, we used to uh, go when UFC was like uh, 
I don't know. I don't know if I should say it was hotter back then because, you know, revenue it's really, wise. It's really probably at its hottest right now. Yeah, but I mean, I, you know, to me, the glory days of, of UFC was when we were going to all those shows. And going to Vegas for these shows was so much fun. And we used to do the convention over Memorial Day weekend. And, you know, I just... Personally, I, I love the idea of a big show in Vegas over Memorial Day weekend. They were always so much fun to go to. We had the convention and everything. And uh, I wonder if that uh, kind of plays into the uh, the ticket sales and everything here. Just like a fun date to travel. Uh, you know, for a lot of people, they, they feel that this pandemic is over. They want to go out on Memorial Day. It's in Vegas. Uh, what do you attribute these numbers to? I mean, there's cert- it's certainly part of it. Um, I just think that they don't come to the West Coast enough. And because of that, there's kind of like a, a, a you know, a, a pent up demand. And secondarily, uh, AEW only does four pay-per-views a year. And um, I think that like Chicago and Vegas, which are the traditional Labor Day and uh, Memorial Day shows, I think that they're always going to do well. I mean, as long as as long as AEW is a fairly hot company, um, I think Chicago will always sell out because it's a great market for them when it comes to a big show. And I think the same for Vegas in the sense of I'm not saying it'll always sell out. The T-Mobile is a big building um, for them to run, and it was very impressive. I mean, the, the key to me with with, it, with with this gate is that two years ago they were going to run um, the MGM Grand, which is you know. A, pretty much across the street um, from T-Mobile for the, you know, the Memorial Day show. And and they had like eight, 9,000 tickets sold, which was good. But it's just like they're so much stronger. Um, they, they got out so much faster for this one. And it really shows like that's that's where people go like, oh, they're not growing. And it's like I look at these numbers and it's like they're growing in the key places that you would see growth. You know, I mean, there's no, you know, and growing substantially, too. You've also got a little blurb here in the uh, AEW section. In a story that may end up significant down the line to AEW or may mean nothing, the shareholders of Discovery Incorporated voted in favor of the merger with Warner Media. Discovery will be in control of the new company having purchased stock from AT&T. Uh, what, are, what, are, uh, what are you thinking here? It's too early to think. You don't know. You know what I mean? It's like if... if um... You just don't know who's going to like wrestling and who's going to not like wrestling and things like that. I think as long as the show is performing well, I think they're fine. But if it's not performing well, you know, these type of these are going to be the new people who are making the decisions. So, uh, you know, it, it, you know, I mean, like changes at at, um, you know, changes in 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 uh, time, you know, uh, uh, TBS and everything like that. We're part of the reason that that WCW died. I mean, not as much as people make it out, not even close, but it is a fact. It was a factor. Sure. You had a guy who didn't like wrestling, but he also didn't like a wrestling company that was losing between 60 and 80 million dollars. So, I mean, well, there are two different stories there, but you know, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, like if W, you know, like if WCW, um, was losing a million or two million dollars a year, I think that they would not have been canceled. I think people would just go, ah, you know, we're getting good. You know, we're, or certainly per- if they were if they were grossing one hundred twenty five million dollars, doesn't matter I mean, how much if, that guy hates wrestling. Oh yeah, yeah, no. If they were making a profit, if they were making a profit, they, they, that it wouldn't. Have, yeah, it, it wouldn't. It would have. It would have never been canceled. But what happened was, they lost an incredible amount of money, so they wanted to sell it. There was a willing buyer, and then you had someone who was just like, you know, I don't really want to, you know, wrestling on my station. And I mean, the thing is, is that the wrestling ratings were underperforming at that time. If the wrestling ratings were what they were before. You know, very few guys cancel your number one rated, rated show or your number two rated show. When it's a show that's doing a little bit below your station average, you're always in trouble. So, yeah, you know, I mean, like that's, you know, where, where people go, oh, it was all Jamie Kellner. And it's like, well, he made the decision, but the decision was made because he could make that decision because the company wasn't doing well. Dave, did the didn't Discovery dip their toe into the water with wrestling for a moment with TNA and with Ring of Honor, or am I hallucinating that that moment in time? Did they not try to do that at, at one point? Um, what, what, what was the station? Destination X were they owned by Discovery? Des- Destination I mean, um, America, yes. Destination America, yeah, 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 yeah. So they did, and then they they canceled, yeah. 
Yeah. Was there any internal just like a feel of like, OK, this isn't for us because it's like you look at some of those like Destination America. It's like it's a channel that's like, it's got barbecue cooking contests. Like there's ways to probably spice up a lot of what they actually do. I mean, it's just it, was there any internal feeling at all about wrestling or about like that genre in, in general there? Or was it like, OK, it was on and it was all so fast. Nobody even noticed. Um, I, as I recall, um, I mean, there were a couple of things that happened, but ultimately the ratings weren't that good. And I mean, that's what, that's what ended up, you know, being, you know, I mean, there were, there's always other factors, but the overriding factor was the ratings weren't that good. So, I mean, it's like if they could come and get a stay, like in at the, you know, you never know what's going to happen in, in negotiations because you don't know how much. When these next negotiations come around, how much AEW is going to ask, how many other people are going to be interested. Um, but, you know, who's in charge is, is is part of it. Like, if they don't like wrestling, they would be, um, you know, less willing to spend, let's say, $125 million a year on wrestling. Um, you know, so all of these these things are all factors come, you know, 2023 20, when they got to negotiate this new television deal. All right, we only have a moment here. I don't think you probably wrote anything about this in The Observer because it just happened today, but Tony Khan was on Busted Open, and he said he will be relaunching Ring of Honor's weekly TV show following Supercard of Honor. So it's continuing on as a separate promotion. Yeah, maybe streaming, maybe television, which says that he probably doesn't have a finalized television deal right now is the way I heard that. But, um, yeah, I mean, we'll see what happens. Um and he also said he's going to book it. And, and um, you know, I worry about, you know, trying to book three television shows. Uh, well, I hope that means that he books the overarching storylines and then hires some other dude to do all the work. Yeah, I suppose. But I just think that his focus should be AEW. It's hard enough to book AEW with the three hours of television every week. But, you know, we'll see exactly how it, you know, works out. I mean, there's ways there's ways you can make it work. Um I just hate to see him, you know, I, I know how hard he works, and I hate to see him adding more to his plate right now. All right, the new Observer is up on the front page of WrestlingObserver.com, everybody. If you sign up today, you can read the entire issue and every issue that we have available. There's over 1,000 issues of the Observer, and there's over uh, 13,000 audio shows in the archive. So there's a lot of great stuff up there. And uh, P.O. Box 1228, Campbell, California, 95009, if you'd like to grab hard copies. And uh, what's the cost, Dave? Uh, that's 1350 uh, would be the cost for uh, a, 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 a month of The Observer. So you can go from there, 115 for uh, 10 months. All right. We're out of time, everybody. Back in a moment with more Observer Live. Our old friend, producer Rob, has been harassing me the last couple of days. Oh, uh, yeah? Yeah. What about? Well, there's a uh, there's a Without a Cause show, mm. which actually looks like it's tonight. I heard he books that promotion. A, what? He doesn't that's book. That's what he said. No, he didn't. Did he actually say that? No, nah, he didn't say that. This Friday. Fine ring announcer, though. Make sure you join us for the first ever Friday night event and live recording for At Indie Wrestling. Hey. 8.15 p.m. That's a weird time. 8.15 p.m.? Wow. Why isn't it 8 p.m.? That's when the... Hey, you've got to make sure everybody's all settled in. The show should actually start then at 9. Then say the show starts at 8 and then start at 8.15. If you say 8.15, it's going to start at 8. I know how these indie shows work. That's right. <laughs> It'll go till 1. Cutthroat Cody is on the show. It was not Cody Rhodes. That I can tell uh, you. You sure? I'm pretty sure there's a picture of him here. Nick Wayne. He's wrestling him. here tonight. He's good. He's not too bad. Uh, not can work on bad. his physique a little bit. A little skinny. Will you stop. You giving him the Zack Sabre treatment? Now look at this. Rob's texting me again. He says he's the ring announcer. Rob's the ring announcer and without a cause tonight. Yeah. Uh, Does a good job. You can get your tickets at brainbusterticks.com slash 318. I guess that'd be 318, because that's, that's the day today, right? Very, very good, Should I retweet yes. this for Rob? Probably. Be nice. Oh, now Rob tells me Cutthroat Cody actually even going to be there. 
War well, pretty horse cutthroat, then. is taking his place, he says. I, that may be an upgrade. What does this know Rob know about anything? Is. You know what I'm going to do? What? I'm calling him. Do it. Yep, I know he's on the chat, so I know he's around. You better pick up, too. Pressure's on you, ring announcer, man. He doesn't know I'm doing this. Well, he's going to know now. Watch him not answer. What, what's the excuse? You're at work? I you see better you on, not hit the button. I see you on the chat, brother. I'm here. Oh, here there we go. He is. What's going on, Rob? Not much, Brian. How you doing? How you doing, Mike? I'm doing great, my man. What's happening? Yeah, it's living the dream, just trying to figure out who's. Yeah. You know that we were uh, going to try and get a guest on from, from New Japan Pro Wrestling here today to talk the New Japan Strong tapings this coming weekend? And we ended up with I, you. I do remember you telling me that. Yeah. That, that, well, you didn't tell me that, that so you know, it'd be par for the course there. <laughs> well, I actually there. wasn't going to have Rob on, but then I was like, if this guy's going to be the ring announcer, let's see how good a promoter he did, he does. Okay, well, what, you know what I'm saying? That's why I'm not a ring announcer. Hey, let's see. see how good a job of promotion he can do for this Without a Cause show tonight. Maybe I'll show up and take your job, Rob. Tell oh, us about yeah, right. this show. We've already taken one job from me. Um, yeah, at least you're not the producer of this place. <laughs> yeah, so this is uh, this is actually um, our first Friday night show. We uh, we normally run on Sunday afternoons, and we're gonna try a little something different. So we're gonna do tonight, uh, and then I think next month's show are scheduled for Friday nights. And if it works, we'll, we may keep doing that. And if not, we'll take it from there. What happened with Sunday? Did you retire to competing with the Lord, or or what was up with Sundays? <laughs> I don't know. I I honestly don't know. They just they, I think they just wanted to try and uh, try and mix things up and see uh, see how it would go on a Friday night as opposed to a Sunday. Now, what's the vibe at these shows like? Because obviously, you know, GCW's got a rabid fan base. We hear about Defy all the time. You know, places like that. West Coast Pro, you know, getting up there too. Tell us about Without a Cause and and what it's all about there. Oh, let's see. Well, we've been around, I want to say, uh, late 2018, I believe. Um, you know, they get a lot of the same people that go to Defy. Um, so they get a really good crowd. Um, God, I mean, we've uh, really started to get a lot more good up and coming indie talent into these shows. So, as you can see, we, I mean, we've had Nick Wayne coming in for a while now. We've got Warhorse. Uh, we had Dan Housen. Uh, a few months ago. A skeletal waif. Hey, listen, Rob. <laughs> without a cause, Demon right? Waif. At without a Demon cause, waif. WA on Twitter. Yeah. Is that right? Yes. Tickets available, yes. brainbustertix.com slash 318. Is that right? That is correct. And you're going to be the ring announcer tonight? I am the I am the ring announcer, yes, at me- infinitum. You going to mess up anybody's name? Probably. All right. Hey, listen, Rob, I appreciate it, but I got to let you go because guess what? I actually got someone from New Japan on the show. Well, well, by all means. No, no <laughs> offense. You, no offense or anything like that, but uh, I'll give it one more plug here at the end. Is that all right? Sounds good, man. Hey, thanks. you know what? You thanks, should, homies. by the way, keep listening. You should get this guy on your Without a Cause show. He's local. I will do that. All right. I will do that. Okay. Stand by, everybody. We're going to do something here because this, this is how I roll. Uh huh. Live yeah. radio, baby. I actually roll much better than I do radio shows, but that's beside oh, yeah? the point. Yeah. Not that kind of rolling, you idiot. Jiu jitsu. God. <laughs> All right. Let's get this uh, fella on here. Technology. Did we uh, do it? Hey, guess who we have, everybody? Clark what? Connors. Oh. Hey, and we got video as well. Look at that. Gotta do it. Yes, Clark, take your hat off. Let's see that hair. Come on, brother. Dude, I got, I got, I got yeah. hair right now. Yeah, yeah I know. I, I thought of the same thing, oh. but it's such a, it's such an incredible head of hair. Wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. I wasn't. Yes. Wait a second. I wasn't told at all about this. And well, as everyone hey, can see, except for Clark right now in the background, Team Filthy here in the background, I wasn't told at all about this. This wasn't clear. Okay, listen very quickly for both of you. I I was contacted. I was asked who I wanted on the show. I gave a list of names, including yours, Clark, and I didn't hear anything after that. And then, like five minutes ago, I heard you get hold of Clark. And I was like, what? No. <laughs> but you know what? Now you're on, Clark. <laughs> And we got, we, yeah, we got less time, but I got questions for you. All right, bring it on. How badly are you going to kick the ass of filthy Tom Lawler? Wait a second. Wait, wait. No, let him talk, Mike. 
What? Yeah, come on. Hey, hey Mike, give me a second here. I got to tell you exactly what's going to happen to Tom Lawler. He's gotten his ass beat a few times in the UFC. He's got he's gotten some challengers here in New Japan, but he's never faced anybody like me. I, trust me, I've been watching this guy's matches for the last two weeks. I haven't done anything except for study Tom Lawler, so I know exactly where his weaknesses are, and I'm going to take advantage of all of them. Dude, when we were at that Seattle show, I, I may have told you this. I, I know for sure I told Tom. But uh, he did his match, and he won. He defended the, the uh, New Japan Strong Openweight title. And then uh, he's celebrating, and he's doing his usual promo, but I was no challengers. And I mean, I was too far away, or I would have gone down there. But then they hit your music, and you came out in your, your it was it the Sonics jersey? And oh, dude, yeah, Sean Kemp, baby. Oh, my God, this place, I'm not kidding everybody. If you don't believe me, like, dude, they went crazy. And you came out. And you started talking some trash, and you wanted the shot right now. And Tom, you know, I expected him to just walk away, but instead he said, you want this fight? Well, let's do it. Get a referee out here. They actually bring the referee out. I'm like, oh, my God. And then he hands the ref the title. The referee holds the belt up. I went, holy smokes, we're seeing a title change here in Seattle. I totally fell for it, hook, line, and sinker. And then this idiot Tom runs over, and he like he's doing a uh, he's like a doing a Sonic's dunk. He grabs his belt and he runs. Oh man, I haven't been gotten like that in a long time. That was so <laughs> well done. And then you know I'm thinking this guy's been the champion for a year. He's beaten all these guys. He ain't beaten Clark. So anyway, Clark, he may be my co-host, but I'm on I'm on Team Clark for this one. Well, that's what I love to hear, Brian. That's what I love to hear. You're on the right side of history on this one. That's right. What was it like getting that reaction there in Seattle as a hometown boy? Yeah, man. I mean, Washington Hall is always the most special place I've ever wrestled in. You know, I mean, it's better to me. It's been better than York Hall. It's been better than Corican. It's been better than the Tokyo Dome. It's a special, intimate place. And, uh, you know, when you walk through the curtain, sometimes you never know how people are going to respond. But I, you know, in Washington Hall, I know exactly how it's going to happen. And, uh, you know, I saw him. He was looking for a challenge. I was drinking a beer backstage after my match, feeling pretty good. And, yeah, I see him wants a challenge, so I figured, hey, why not me? So, uh, yeah, that, there's no problem with me. I would have beat his ass there. The only thing I'm mad about is he made me take my eyes off, you know, so I had to get all that back and almost <laughs> lost my ring on that one too. Oh, you don't want to do that, buddy. Now, uh, you know, I've been watching you for a long time, Clark, and uh, there is a uh, very, very noticeable difference, uh, just like in the last few months, it seems to me, a level of confidence that you have in the ring. Like, uh, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's no longer being a, a young lion, graduating, time in the ring. Do you feel the same way I do? And was there like a, a, a light switch moment for you? Yeah, a little bit. I think the biggest thing for me has been um, just the young line system. It tears you down, you know. Like that's the whole point, right? It's tear you down to rebuild you, especially with Shibata and the way he uh, he fights and teaches. So for me, it's I've always had this side of me in me, but uh, I've almost been a little gun shy to show it again. So it's been a it's been a long time coming. So I think when uh, TJ and I have been kind of were kicking it off there for a little bit. Uh, during that match series, he really brought it back out of me. So I'm feeling just as confident again. I'm feeling the fun side of of uh, Clark Connors again. The after party's coming out a little bit, and that's, that's who I am, really. I'm not just some wild rhino ass kicker. I'm I'm more than that. And uh, I just I would say, don't be surprised if you see some of that against against Tommy coming up here in Tampa. Yeah, I got to mention Tampa. We've got uh, this uh, March 20th Sunday, uh, the Coliseum. Uh, 535 yes. 4th Avenue, North St. Petersburg, Florida. And uh, a lot of big names here on the show. Clark is here, obviously. We've got Jay White, Filthy Tom Lawler, Juice Robinson, Fred Rosser, Jonah, Carl Fredericks, Hikaleo, and Rocky Romero with, with more to be announced. But uh, that's coming up. Tickets on sale. There's $30, $50, $80, $150 for ringside A. So uh, big show coming up on... Uh, on Sunday night. Yeah, you guys, I just want to say uh, 
right now, I, I was feeling in the locker room last time we were there at the last shows and the last couple shows, the momentum's building was strong. And uh, I want to tell anyone to get on the bottom floor of this thing right now because the people just, Brian just mentioned are just, that's our base roster, you know, and then we bring in a bunch of people to come and fight the best. So this is a program and a, and a uh, show that honestly, it's only going to grow from here. It's already growing and, and we're on our way. So if you want to get on the ground floor of the best wrestling in the world, start watching now. New Japan Strong, it really is. It's it's the best show, honestly, week after week on TV. And the, the live shows are supposedly incredible to go to, too, as, as Brian has mentioned. But you know what? You know, as, as travel restrictions ease, as time changes, at some point those walls are going to come down. How much are you jonesing to get over to Japan and to show off over there? Yeah, no, see, that's, that's my biggest thing right now is I love Strong and I love, you know, the idea of – sticking around on strong and doing my thing. But, uh, you know, Japan's always what it's been about for me. And so for most important, uh, thing is what I'm going to do is my plan right now is I'm going to beat Tom on Sunday and I'm going to take that open weight championship over to Japan as soon as possible. And hope to God, the G, uh, excuse me, my G one, which is the best of the super juniors is, uh, where I want to, I want to have it on the line and I'll put it up in every match. I don't care. I'm going to have that title and I'm going to go over there and win best of the super juniors. And I'm going to win the junior title as well. So that's just my plans. And then, you know, we'll come back to strong and hopefully all those Japanese guys come back to strong too and make this product even better too. You know, Rocky wants to win that junior title, Clark. Good for him, yeah. Well, you know, he, he can have his... I'll give him a shot once it's mine. I don't give a crap, you know? So, so uh, you know, sometimes these these uh, they, the juniors, they bulk up ultimately, and they, they, they do the heavyweight division. Is that like your long-term goal, is to actually be a New Japan heavyweight? Or do you want to... Do you have the goal of, like, I'm going to be the, the greatest junior heavyweight of all time? Think about that during the break, Clark, because I asked a question right. right at the music. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Clark Connors, we've got about two minutes here. Clark, very quickly, future heavyweight or the best junior heavyweight of all time? How about both? It's going to be the best junior heavyweight, but let me tell you something. I'm already bigger than Ishii, and I can see how he does it out there. So if the time comes, the time comes, I'll tell you that much. All right, this coming Sunday, it is you and filthy Tom Lawler for Tom's New Japan Strong Openweight Championship. He's been champion for a year. He's turned back all challengers. Is it going to happen Sunday, Clark? I can guarantee it, Brian. Here's the thing is I've been watching Tom Lawler for the past two weeks. I haven't left this room, basically. It's basically like I had COVID again, and I'm just sitting here just watching his film, studying what he can do, and I know that my, my style matches up real well for it. And just like I said, be expecting to see something new out of Clark Connors, and I'm going to take that title all the way around to the United States of America coming up here soon. You do this for Sean Kemp, right? Yes, sir. The hammer, baby. Exactly. And his 97 kids. <laughs> Strong Style Evolved is coming up Sunday, March 20th at the Coliseum, St. Petersburg, Florida. All of the biggest stars of New Japan Strong are going to be there. Filthy, Jay White Juice, Robinson, Fred Rosser, Jonah, Carl Fredericks, the Wild Rhino himself. Oh, get that shirt out of here, Mike, you idiot. Clark Connors, Hikaleo, Rocky Romero, and more. And let's get some quick plugs in for your social media, Clark. Yeah, you can follow me at uh, on Instagram and Twitter, both at Clark.Connors. And uh, that's all I got right now. I don't really have a whole lot of social media. And uh, my homegirl, Sue, has been taking care of most of it anyway. She does a great job. Excellent. Well, hey, thanks so much for doing the show today. Best of luck this weekend. I can't wait. I can't wait to find out what happens. And we're out of time, everybody. Thanks, Mike, as always. Callers and listeners up in the studio. We'll talk to you next time. Wrestling Observer Live.